Uh, as I said, <coughs> a, few, a few years ago, I realized that, that, that the issue of polarity was coming to an end, and I thought I was reaching the point where I wanted to reach. I wanted to know when a neuron knew where to put an axon from the cell body. And that I, I started to, to, to think that I wanted to know how the, the opposite was happening, how the neuron was deconstructing. Uh, so you construct and deconstruct things. And, uh, <clears throat> and the deconstruction of the brain was for me the reason, the type of deconstruction of the brain that we can have would be, was for me the reason that would define whether we are going to have a normal deconstruction or a pathological deconstruction. In other words, a normal brain aging or a pathological brain aging. I still don't know how that is truly linked, but I thought that was something that I could use my experience in constructions to understand the construction. And so you'll see why, why I got into this field uh, in a minute. So, so ma major feature that, that worries everybody as, as especially, uh, you know, people my age, as we age, is, you know, losing cognitive abilities. And to which extent this loss of cognitive abilities are getting us closer to developed dementias. Uh, so, you, know, you can see here that these are active zones of the brain you put particular tasks. Uh, and whereas in the old brain, the same intensity does not elicit the same responses as in the man. That doesn't mean that the brain is not responding. If I would put this stimulus like a few seconds strong, a few seconds longer, or a few amperes stronger, I will get this. But to an equal stimulus of learning or retention, here I have an activity and here I don't. On the other hand, and a type of response that is elicited in the old, in the young, is not elicited in the old. But other type of responses is not that are elicited in the old. It's not that it's only loss that it happens to everybody as we age. There are also some gains, but and and there is a deficit. I need more in order to induce the same. <clears throat> And one way to look at these things in an easy way, and so you, don't, you have to have a readout in your experiments, something that is easy for you to see if, you, if you're planning to do experiments. One easy way is to do an electrical recording on neurons. You put a patch, and then you can record. You do a stimulus, a high-frequency stimulus here, and then you see it's a, a stimulus that is it's a learning paradigm. Uh, so you do a high-frequency stimulation, and then you stop, and then the, the, the target neuron, you have the pipette, and it starts responding with an activity. And this is the activity of the young that responds very intensely, and this is the activity of the old. So, so the same that you see here, you can see in an easier way. So the question is, what, what is, so we have to tackle this problem. So my idea is I want to understand what is leading to, 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 our, to our losing abilities of retaining and learning. Uh, so one way of tackling the problem, you will see is this, was to look at plasma membrane domains. I wanted to know plasma membrane are very upstream of us. So we lose abilities. So, so don't be fooled by what I'm going to say. So if we lose abilities, cognitive, the function of our is because we are losing, as we age, lots of different things. So the aging is a very comprehensive process where there is a mix between gene expression changes and oxidative damage and metabolism, etc. So, but that doesn't, so the fact of knowing that is very comprehensive and very abundant or not very broad doesn't help us to understand how the loss in cognition occurs. We have to use one system. The system we decided to look into to understand how we lose cognition abilities is to look at lipid protein organization as we age. And it's very simple. People take advantage of the things that are, past, are part of their past. And in my case, I have a past 
on lipid plasma membrane lipid organization during brain construction. So I'm going to look into the deconstruction and see how it happens. So we'll say reason number one. So the reason number one for choosing lipid membrane domains and organization during aging as a possible putative responsible element in the cognitive loss is because are very upstream, so are plasma membrane events. Receptor, neurotransmitter receptors are plasma membrane receptors and they are involved, these platforms are involved in cell signaling, controlling the strength of neurotrophins and neurotransmitter receptors. Therefore, I have a reason. These receptors are part of platforms and are involved in cognition. Okay, so we say, well, maybe these platforms are perturbed. Yeah, this is simply the, the drawing and how membrane receptors are embedded into microdomains in the plasma membrane that are called the tertiary lipid rafts are called, and they are a mix between cholesterol and sphingomyelin and gangliosides and transmembrane proteins. Okay, so all the cells, plasma membranes, are organized in microdomains, and these are signaling platforms. So this is reason. Number, reason number two, our own only observations that some of the signs of serving non-familiar Alzheimer's brain are due to change in membrane lipid protein interaction. These are publications that we had on this, and this say the, the following. There is one pathway for the degradation of one toxic peptide in the brain that involves the binding of this molecule that is called plasminogen to the plasma membrane in these membrane microdomains. This is important for the generation of the active form of this, of this molecule that is called plasmin. And this leads, plasmin is very efficient in degrading a peptide that is called amyloid. In Alzheimer's disease, these rafts are perturbed and this event doesn't occur. Okay, and you will see it here. In Alzheimer's disease, there is a loss of one of the lipids of the rafts. Plasminogen cannot bind to the surface, therefore cannot be activated into plasmin, cannot, be, cannot lead to amyloid degradation, therefore there is amyloid accumulation. So we had these two series of evidence that made us think that maybe during aging we had a problem with lipids. So we asked the following obvious questions. Does any peculiar change, whether in quality or quantity, in brain lipids occur during aging? Do we have aging is, is accompanied by anything? So we, we, we concentrate on the hippocampus. So we started to look into a structure of the brain that is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a structure, uh, as it says here, so where memories and long-time memories are stored and kept. So we decided to go into this structure, took this structure out of the brains of mice or rats at different ages, and measure different lipids. And one of the things that we could see, this is from the mouse of uh, the brain, and these are hippocampal neurons maintained in vitro for different times. And you can see that as we age, there is a loss, gradual and persistent and significant, though not so big, here is almost 20%, of cholesterol from these detergent-resistant membrane domains. You can see here the levels of cholesterol. This is the molecular weight. This is the standard. So it's cholesterol this band, and this cholesterol this band, and cholesterol is this band. And you see with time in vitro. And this is the whole hippocampus. So you wanted to know, not the whole hippocampus, since you are studying cognition. These are purified membranes. But you want to know the, the, the membrane of the synapse, the place where the communication occurs. So you did the same experiment, but instead of using the whole membrane hippocampus, these are synaptosomes from mice of one month, four months, 21 months. You see that already at four months, it starts to be a gradual decrease. This is lipids were extracted, measured by mass spectrometry, so this is in picomoles, and again. So aging comes with the loss of a bit of cholesterol, but this is 15, 20% during time. So, you know, what are the consequences? Losing 20% of cholesterol is certainly compatible with life. Animals live, uh, they are alive here, and they perform. They are a bit, you know, if you put them to do electrophysiology, they are slower, but they are alive. Is this, imagine that you're losing 20% of your freezing potential of your freezer. 
not much will happen. You know, some things will suffer more than others, but everybody will suffer a bit. With cholesterol, it's the same. So you're losing 20%. Imagine that you're losing 20% of capacity of mitochondria to generate ATP. You know, they're still compatible, but you're losing. The problem would, could come if you put an extra stress. But we will see what happens when you lose 20% of cholesterol. So this is nothing I can do. Life comes with that, at least in the mouse. I don't know what happens in, in us, humans. So let's look at the effect of cholesterol loss with aging on synaptic function. Does it have an effect? Is that the loss of capacity to learn or to or to have an LTP, is, that, is, is anything related to this cholesterol loss? Uh, perhaps not, so we decided to study this. Uh, and if this is how. So the, the, the first thing we did in order to address <coughs> this question was to focus on a molecule, which we know is this molecule is called Marx. And the reason why we chose this molecule, Marx, will come in a minute. But the main reason that we chose this molecule is, well, there are two reasons that are branches of one reason. On one hand, it binds cholesterol, and the other hand is involved in synaptic plasticity. That means in cognition, in LTP. So we chose this mark, molecule, Marx, that you see has two domains here that bind to the plasma membrane. And you put in, in the, the calcium entry, this molecule dissociates, activates calcium calmoduling, and then it starts a whole procedure of synaptic plasticity that you will see better illustrated here. The rationale for choosing marks. A, functions requires binding to cholesterol-rich domains. So we, lost, we saw that there was a bit less cholesterol. It determines PIP2 clustering, PI45, OK? And this is important because PIP2 clustering on the plasma memory is required for learning and memory gene expression, Y, B, or Y. So hydrolysis by PLC gamma and activation of the inositol 3-phosphate, PLC, diacylglycerol, and then IP3-sensitive calcium channel and activation protein kinase C for phosphorylation and activation of genes that are involved in learning and memory, especially the Krebs pathway. So third, required for postsynaptic actin remodeling. So we chose this molecule as an educated guessing. As you know, people would say, you have to choose something. So the question we ask is, does age come with a change in Mark contest, content in synapses? We saw cholesterol was low. Now we chose Marks. Intuitively, you would say that as you age, you would lose, because of the loss of cholesterol, you would lose Mark's capacity of association to the plasma membrane in synapses. And the answer is yes. Here is what you see. In the membrane, you see this decrease, which is fairly significant in 10 months in synapses. However, not in the total. So in the rest of the cell, the Mark's levels are normal. The cytosolic pool is normal. It's only the membrane-associated pool and only the membrane-associated pool in the synaptic fraction. This is the standard that you use, and then you see that between 10 months and 20 months in the synapses of hippocampal neurons, you have a reduction in marks, which is consistent with the reduction that we've seen with cholesterol. You will see later, it says, what about, as I told you, marks is required for the clustering of PIP3, PIP2, and PIP2 is important for the activation of PLC gamma. So the question is, what are the levels of PIP2 and PLC gamma in the same synapses? If we lose this, then you are going to have less clusters and perhaps more transformation of PIP2 via PI3 kinase into PIP3 and less hydrolysis by PLC gamma. Let's see what happens. And here you can see that in the 20-month-old mice, in the synapses of the hippocampus, you have very little PIP2. And consistently, you have very little, very high PIP3. Therefore, your PIP2 has been the cluster and is now a target for PI3 kinase, and then you're making lots of PIP3. On the other hand, PLC gamma, that you need it, okay, then you have very little PLC gamma. And consistent with these high levels of PIP3, you have very high levels of phosphoact. Phosphoact is downstream PIP3, uh, PI3 kinase PIP3. So I hope you guys, some of you at least, are more or less familiar with this Fofinositide pathway. If not, it's too bad. Uh, but anyway, just, just to make the picture, we are having things that are consistent with the loss of cholesterol, the loss of marks, 
and because of the loss of market, we have less PIP2, and because of this, we have less PLC gamma, and on the other hand, it's not that PIP2 got degraded, but PIP2 got shifted towards PI3 kinase, PIP3. And this is survival pathway. So this is mostly a plasticity pathway. PLC gamma, PIP2 is a plasticity pathway, and PI3, PIP3 and ACT is a survival. As if, as if, just, just a ball, a balloon in the air, as if the loss of cholesterol was disfavoring performance, but on the other hand, favoring survival. I cannot prove it, but, but it looks that way. And maybe it's a defense mechanism that we have to perform less in order to guarantee survival. Who knows? That would be very cynical, but, but you know, maybe the system is like this. Now the question is, OK, just say with high PIP3 and, and ACT. So very weak plasticity with robust survival signaling, which you know, will be nice to one day do experiments to test to which extent if I improve, if I improve too much uh, plasticity is deleterious. I don't know, but those are experiments that one could think of doing to test the correlation between survival and plasticity. Uh, so now we're going to do the true experiments, the true physiology. We're going to put marks back, marks back in the brain of all mice and see if we gain some sort of plasticity, learning abilities. So in order to do this, uh, we did an adeno-associated virus mediated in vivo gain of function. And so this is simply to show that, that the adeno-associated virus had a strong, strong preference for new new N positive cells, that means a strong preference for neurons, skipping glial cells, these are GFP positive cells, and you see that in the, in the field of these are glial cells, the glial cells are not being transduced, only the neurons, okay? Uh, so the vector is working fine to overexpress proteins in, in neurons. Uh, so the next thing we do is in vivo marks gain of function, the neuron, and then we say, is that an improved biochemistry of plasticity? As you say, the biochemistry of plasticity was PIP2 and PLC gamma. These are readouts. I can use many readouts of, of brain plasticity. We, use, we, use, we are going to use one, okay, for the sake of, of simplicity. And so you can see that when we put the wild type marks, we gain PLC gamma activity, which is the one that is, is important for us. And you can see that, yeah. and this is some, it's a, it's a mutant that cannot bind to cluster PIP2. And so in this one, we don't gain. So the wild type does induce an increase, the mutant does not. And this is simply about saying what we say before, this doesn't have a major effect. So we increase PLC gamma, and this does not come with a reduction in the survival branch because this means that we increase PIP2, and by increasing PIP2, apparently we didn't decrease PIP3 to go to ACT, but we didn't measure much. It's simply an indication. Uh, so in vivo marks gain of function again, and now we say, we say that we had an improvement in biochemistry. We're going to say if we had an improvement in the electrical response. Uh, so we focus on LTP, as I said before. So you do a tetraverse stimulation, that means a very high frequency stimulation, and then you go and see what is the response. And the, risk, the young animals, these are slices. I explain to you guys because I don't think that there are too many neuro people here. So you take the brain of a mouse, then you dissect the brain, you do a slice. So you, you know, a feta, a slice, and then you put an electrode in one part where you know that the afferents go to the hippocampus, a pipette in the other. You do a high frequency stimulation, you record in the part where you had stimulated, and then you see that in, in a slice from a young mouse, the, there is a very, what is called afterburst stimulus, and this is the long term potentiation. This is the electrical paradigm of learning and memory. In the old, the response is much weaker. Starts, is smaller, and then it's much weaker. And this is simply an old. Now, the old was here, like this one. And this is the old when you added marks. So you are able to rescue the biochemistry and the electrical response in the old by simply adding marks. 
And this is in a membrane binding dependent manner because this is the, the old electro, this is the, the, the overexpression of the marks. So that means the young marks into the old brain and you obtain a very nice LTP. However, if you overexpress on top the mutant marks that cannot bind, it competes and it has an, a dominant negative effect. It doesn't, it doesn't increase. And obviously, the last experiment you want to do, you do a rescue biochemistry, a rescue electrophysiological, now you try to do a rescue behavior. So does the mouse with more marks in the brain, an old mouse, have a better learning? And with lots of good will, you can see here that it doesn't. Okay, so it improves, but not in this particular paradigm. This is the latency. So you, are you familiar with the Morris water maze? It's just you take a mouse and you drop a mouse in a tank, in a water tank. And, and you put a platform uh, where the mouse, if, if the mouse finds the platform, it will not drown uh, because it will be almost at the surface. Uh, so if the mouse, so, so at the beginning, you put the mouse in the water tank and you teach the mouse where the platform is. So the, the, eventually the mouse finds the platform and stays there. And then you give it you know, a piece of sugar or a pellet of food, etc. Then you take that mouse again, and the day after you do it again, and again you help, and that, that's all. So every day you do, this is acquisition sessions. Until you see that the mice learn with much, you know, short time, learn about where the platform is. So they have learned. So you put the mouse, and then the mouse goes. And then, etc. And then you see that between the marks and the control, there isn't. So that was quite disappointed. So disappointing. And then, then we did another test in which is a bit more abrupt. And this is kind of like learning after several sessions of teaching. Now there are other paradigm that is, that is a much faster learning. What is it? This one. Uh, in which you do. This is that you put a, a quick learning experience. And this is, is, is um, in the freezing is the conditioning fear. Uh, so you put in a platform, you give a tone, you put in a, in a certain environment, you give a tone, and then you give a shock to the feet, and then, then, then the mouse freezes. And then you put again the mouse in that thing, and you give a tone, and then the mouse, even if you don't do the, the, the shock, the mouse freezes. Okay, because I learned to associate the tone with it. Now, both freeze. Now, the, the one with the marks, immediately, if you change the context and you give it a tone, if the animal is either stupid or more intelligent, we say, no, here there's not going to be a shock because this is not the same environment. So the marks mice are like this. I don't know if more intelligent or more unconscious. I don't know. But the referee thought that they were more intelligent and we were very happy. And so we sold it as the marks had improved it. Eh? So now the question is, what we can take, this is being published, and uh, so the, the, the message you can take from here is that in the young synapses, you have lots of marks that is recruiting PIP2 into the synapse, and this is very important for the hydrolysis of PIP2, which then is important for the activation, calcium mediated via PLC gamma activation of memory genes. In the old synapses, you have much less PI3, more, much more PI3 kinase because the marks is not recruiting PIP2, and then you have more towards the survival pathway and less towards the PLC gamma pathway towards synaptic plasticity. So part of the problems that we may be having, experiencing to learn when we are aging is because we don't have enough marks and the biochemical pathway I just told you. Now, what is the relationship of these marks with the loss of cholesterol? Is synaptic cholesterol loss in there behind the mark loss? So this is the upstream, and these are the data that have not been published and we're trying to publish. Remember that as we age, we had this decrease in cholesterol content in the synapse, and remember that I told you one of the reasons why we chose marks was because it was a cholesterol binding and synaptic plasticity. So now the question is, is synaptic cholesterol loss in the age behind the marks loss? So the first experiment is you can see that, you know, synapses of young mice, when you induce in the synapses, again, you take synapses from young mice, 
then you expose to a paradigm when you can remove a tiny bit of cholesterol, and what you obtain is that you reduce the amount of marks. So by losing marks, you can induce the loss, or by losing cholesterol, you can induce the loss of marks. On the other hand, you do the opposite experiment, and by putting more cholesterol into the synapses of old that had very little, you can rescue to the levels of the young. And this you can see here. So now there is no before there was difference, and now there is no difference. Now the question is, so it seems that cholesterol loss is sufficient and necessary to induce the loss of marks from synapses, at least in part. Uh, so now if it is the reduced loss of cholesterol rescuing the marks, then we say, to which extent is the reduced cholesterol in the synapses of the old reflected by a perturbation of the biochemistry of neurotransmitter receptors, the receptors that mediate synaptic plasticity, glutamate receptors. And you will see here that, again, you can look. We are going to have this is the receptor. We are going to look at adapters. How much? By losing cholesterol, you lose the adapters that are important to dissociate from the receptors in order for the receptor to transmit signaling for gene expression or, or acting remodeling. And here you can see that in the control animals, when you put the neurotransmitter, the excitatory neurotransmitter that induces synaptic plasticity, you dissociate or degrade the either ACAP 150, these are adapters, or PSD 95, Whereas if you have low cholesterol content, like in the old, now you are not able to neither dissociate nor degrade, degrade or dissociate a PSD95 or a cap. So the biochemistry of the loss of cholesterol is perturbing synaptic plasticity. On the one hand, because we don't have enough PIP2 in order to go to the PLC gamma pathway. But on the other hand, we are having a defect at the level of the true receptors, the AMPA receptors, the glutamate receptors that mediate synaptic plasticity. So we're going to do, so we say, if we have an alter, a cap and PSD95 removal from the spine, the synapse, okay, this may be reflected in a change in glutamate receptor dynamics. So we're having an effect in synaptic plasticity, not anymore indirect via PIP2, marks PIP2, but directly on the receptor. So we're going to look at receptors, single unit receptors, lateral diffusion and internalization, which are important for this, this long term. So I explained to you that long-term depression and long-term potentiation. This is not memory acquisition and memory loss. Long-term potentiation is not that we learn things to long-term potentiation and we we'll forget because of long-term depression. No, so you need to potentiate and then you depress uh, activity with long-term depression, you will see how it looks. Long-term potentiation, remember, it looks like you have more activity, you do a, a high frequency stimulation and you have more activity. A long-term depression, you have a low frequency stimulation and you have less activity. And both things are necessary for the learning process. And both things involve the lateral, <coughs> the dynamic of single receptor, of the AMPA receptors, that in which case, in the long-term depression, you need lateral diffusion, internalization, and then when it comes to high-frequency stimulation, you need a recycling and reinsertion. Classical cell biology, lateral diffusion, internalization, and insertion back. So we are going to look at receptor dynamics. As you say, lateral diffusion and internalization in all neurons, and to which extent, if there is any defect, this is related to cholesterol loss. Now we say, we're going to measure AMPA receptor diffusion. One molecule of AMPA receptor, you use, utilize an antibody, an anti and then this antibody will bind to the AMPA receptor, then you have a biotin fragment, and then you put one of these tiny quantum dots. And then you go and do live cell microscopy. And these things move in all directions, and then you use particular type of markers and particular type of software, and then you can quantify Okay, whether your molecule is confined, how much it moves when you put a neurotransmitter that is excitatory there, how much it moves from the synapse to the side. So you can label, these are the traces that you have, the, the pink places are the synapses that you label with one particular GFP protein, and these are the different type of quantum dots. And then you can quantify how much 
is the speed without, uh, within a synaptic cleft, and how much is the speed once it moves away from the synapse. And it doesn't really matter all the technique. Now people can do it. Uh, so you can, you can have this, this software from the internet, and then the, the tools how to label is also possible to do. Now you can see that in the young animal, there is, when you put glutamate, there is an increased lateral diffusion within the synapse of a single receptor. And there is also an increased diffusion in the receptors outside the synapse. So there is synaptic and perisynaptic increased lateral diffusion in the presence of glutamate. Now, in, an old cell, in a cell from an old animal, it doesn't matter how much glutamate you put, the receptors move much less. There is very little diffusion, which is, again, a bit counterintuitive with the loss of cholesterol. But then we can discuss it later. Because you would say, oh, I lost cholesterol and then I will have more, more fluidity. Apparently, it's not the case. We don't know what we think we know what may be happening. But what we have is apparently a restrict diffusion. And we have seen this restrict diffusion also by putting a probe outside, a GPI anchor photoactive oval. I didn't bring the data. And one that is for the uh, palmitolated domain, also GFP photoactive oval. And the cells seem to be having, supporting less lateral diffusion in the old. So this is something that is happening. And now the question is whether this lack of mobility, whether inside or outside the synapses, are cholesterol loss dependent. And the answer is yes, but only inside the synapse, which is consistent with what we saw. We mostly see the cholesterol loss within synaptosomes, not so much in the, in the, in the rest. So most of what we see is synaptic. So when we put the old cholesterol, and then you put, you can rescue cholesterol by adding cholesterol directly, cholesterol cyclodextrin mix, or you can use it by knocking down a gene of the enzyme that we think is responsible for the cholesterol loss. This enzyme is an enzyme that adds a hydroxyl group to cholesterol and then becomes more water soluble, and it's called C46A1. So this is a, a cyrna virus that, that knocks down this enzyme, and then again we can we can risk. So gaining cholesterol either by knocking down C46 or gaining cholesterol by directly addition of cholesterol cyclodextrin mix restores AMPA mobility after glutamate stimulation. So, as I said, so this was a canonical cell biology, so we have reduced lateral diffusion, so that reduced lateral diffusion, if we have reduced lateral diffusion, that should be reflected in that we have more receptor on the surface. So, because lateral diffusion is required for the ulterior internalization, Indeed, this is the case. You can see it here. This is in the, in the young cells. This is in vitro. So I don't know how valid the system is, but again, it's reproducible. In 30-day in vitro neurons, you have much more receptor on the surface than 15, even though the levels of receptor total are the same. Now the question is, in the presence of glutamate, this receptor becomes internalized in 15-day in vitro neurons, but it doesn't become internalized in 30-day in vitro neurons. So it's, again, consistent with what we saw. And this is restoring cholesterol. You see how, by restoring cholesterol, we lose labeling from the surface. Okay? It's cholesterol plus glutamate. In the old, plus glutamate doesn't induce. Now we put back cholesterol, we knock down C46, and now the receptor disappears from the surface. This disappearance from the surface should therefore mean that cholesterol helps the internalization, the classical cell biological experiment, add an antibody from outside, let it bind, wash, warm up the cells, internalize, and then label the cells inside. Okay, so it's a classical pool chase experiment of surface labeling versus intracellular receptor labeling. And then you can see again here, these are young cells, 15 day in vitro. Eh? Then you can see that in the presence of glutamate, a lot of receptor. Now we are measuring internalized, lots of receptor. This is, this is in the cell body areas, but in the neurates area, you increase internalization. Now we are looking at only intracellular receptor. Whereas in the, in the old cells, either, even if you add glutamate, you don't get any internalization, any significant internalization, consistent with the fact that 
we don't have any lateral diffusion. No. So now the question is, again, now when we, again, restore cholesterol by knocking down the gene or by adding cholesterol, what we do is cholesterol plus glutamate, we again in, uh, increase the amount of, in the process, we increase the amount of cholesterol, the, of receptor that is internalized. So is that, is that normal? Summary. Synaptic receptor dynamics uh, in the hippocampus, not is in the hippocampus of all animals. Poor neurotransmitter mediated receptor adapter dissociation. I show you with PSD 95 and a cap 150. Reduce neurotransmitter mediated receptor lateral diffusion, cholesterol loss dependent. Excess constitutive receptor accumulation in the surface, cholesterol loss dependent. So we have more receptor in the surface and we have reduced neurotransmitter receptor internalization, all cholesterol loss dependent. So this tiny bit of cholesterol that is lost during aging is having a number of consequences. Somewhat not very useful for function, apparently. So we say is, do we have all what I showed before is lateral diffusion and internalization that are part of the mechanism of long-term depression. So the question is, do we have poor long-term depression? So we did, as I explained to you, Shaffer cholesterol LTD induction. So you take the brain of the mouse, you slice it, and then you put it in vitro. You stimulate in the CA3 area and record in the CA1 area. It's called a mossy fiber pathway with low frequency, and then you go and record. Remember that the LTP, when you do a high frequency stimulation, you will see activity over here. Now with LTD, it's low frequency stimulation. You can also elicit this low frequency stimulation or sort of, a, instead of using a low frequency stimulation, you can use an MDA, that is an agonist for glutamate receptors. And then you see this is the response of the young animal, the open circles, and this is the response of the old, much weaker. Almost, except for the beginning, the old animals, the slices from the old animals do not respond very well. Now, if you do cholesterol rescue, now is that this is the old, okay? We have the NMDA, no LTD, but now if we put this cholesterol rescue or we knock down the gene in the hippocampus, in this case it's intraventricular, then we have a very strong and very important LTD in, in slices from the old animals. Uh, is cholesterol loss sufficient? This, uh, this is a typical experiment that people like Fabian like, is that you take an old, a young animal and then you remove cholesterol and see if it's, uh, you have the same effect as if an old animal constitutively, and the answer is yes. So 10 months, uh, 10 months control, they have a very nice LTD, okay? So an MDA, very strong LTD, and these young animals in which you have removed cholesterol, now they have an LTD as, as if they were old. So you see that many young people that have, they behave like old, then you can start thinking why they could be, okay? Uh, yeah, there are plenty. Now the question is, all this was in vitro. So the question is, is that happening in vivo? So if you take an animal that is alive, and then you go and record, is that, does the old animal have poor LTD alive? And uh, if it has, is it, can you rescue this with cholesterol? And this was a question that the editor of a journal asked us to address before sending the paper for in-depth review. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy question. I said, oh, you don't, everything is very nice, but everything is in vitro. I don't think I will send it for in-depth revision unless you have it in vivo. I say, how do I do this experiment? Luckily, Madrid, Madrid has a strong tradition in neurosciences, and this is the Cajal Institute. And in the Cajal Institute, there is this girl, Alejandra Korovaychuk. I'm sure Fabian will know where she comes from. Yeah, exactly. And she comes from Argentina, and she says, yes, we can do it, because we do re register in live animals. So apparently, using electrophysiological recordings in very old animals is very difficult, because of the lipidic changes composition, cells are not very easy to patch. But she, because of doing special favor to me, because I say, okay, we have a common flag and Cristina Kirchner and all this kind of thing, Peron, Maradona, Messi, etc. She said, fine, you're convinced me. And she did this experiment. She was a postdoc in the lab of Oscar Herrera, who is a fantastic electrophysiologist, and, and, and they did the recording. So, pipette number two is showing where we 
would stimulate for the long fre low frequency stimulation and on top add cholesterol. So we had cholesterol in two places in the brain of these old animals that were, you know, they were anesthetized at least, okay? But they were alive, they were 20 month old mice and, and so we would put so that the cholesterol would come in the form of a penumbra that we wouldn't get too much. So we put a bit distance, and this is the place where we stimulate it, and this is the place where we record it. And this, what happens here is, here what happens is, in the old animal, you don't have LTD, whereas in the young, you do have very much. The interesting aspect of this approach is that you use the same animal, it's experimental and control, because you do the same experiment on the opposite, in the other half of the brain, and instead of putting cholesterol, you can put another sterol. So you can put oleic acid or you can put one of these plant sterols, stigmasterol or regosterol, et cetera. And, and so everything went fine. They had no clue what to expect. And it says, but on the other hand, in the old plus, okay, in the old that had almost no LTD, okay, so this is the old or no LTD. Now if you put cholesterol in, in, in this way, then it will have a fantastic LTD. So we had it in vitro and... Uh, we also had it in vivo. And another control that Alejandra Gorobaychuk is not from Corre is not from Paraná, it's from Misiones. Yeah, Misiones. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's another, another paisano. Uh, so here, it's the same. So this is oleic acid and this is stigmasterol. As I said, we did in the other half, of, they did in the other half of the brains, the right controls with oleic acid and stigmasterol, and you could not see a rescue, which is very bad. It's very bad. I wish, I wish we had been able to manage to have a rescue also with stigmasterol. Because if we had been able to rescue with stigmasterol, we could have tried to give stigmasterol orally. Because stigmasterol, different from cholesterol, stigmasterol crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it would, be, it would have been the same. Well, the, 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 the cholesterol of youth, but it didn't work. So uh, too bad, too bad. It was very disappointing, I tell you. Not, but because sting, all, all plant sterols that now you're getting with food supplements, mm -hmm. Danacol, Benecol, all these kind of things, all these are plant sterols, and those cross the blood-brain barrier. Whereas it doesn't matter how much pork, wheat, the blood cholesterol doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So, so our brain cholesterol is independent from our peripheral cholesterol. Anyway, so with here, we, didn't, we were not able to rescue. In this case, with oleic acid, you still have a poor LTD, and with stigmasterol, it still had a poor LTD. So it was a good control on the one hand, but a bad result on the other, okay? So now, let, let's see now if with this result, the referee wants it. Now, the problem is that when we send the paper now with this experiment, the, okay, so I'll show you more or less what we had. Uh, so we had reduced LTP, plasticity, trovo et al. via Marx. And now we had the reduced plasticity, LTD, because of the cholesterol, and we haven't published yet. And so one of the problems we had is we submitted this paper with the in vivo results, and one of the referees says, here you're missing some more mechanism. Now with mechanism, I presented the first part with a cap and PSD95, and especially the behavior. So that was, in Spain, a 10,000 euros experiment, because you had to put cholesterol in 30 <laughs> animals. 10 is your control, saline solution, pumps, 10 animals for the cholesterol, and 10 animals for another irrelevant or you know, another sterol, that is it. So 10 animals at 300 euros each of, a, that's what it costs a 20 month old rat or a mouse. It's a 9,000 euro experiment for a lab. In Madrid, it's something. But anyway, I'm Argentinian, <laughs> have friends, and in the end we found these 30 animals and we did the experiment. Uh, so with cholesterol, you know, better rescue the performance of old mice. You remember that the marks was iffy, eh? It got published, but the rescue was, hmm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't inject myself with marks. But, uh, so, but on the other hand, since cholesterol is upstream marks and is more pleiotrophic because it's, involved, it's, it's regulating more things, but say, well, maybe cholesterol rescue is better. So we did the experiment with rescue. So we had to do these mini pumps all set pulses of cholesterol during 30 days and do the behavior. 
Here I have my friend, Cesar Venero, who is in the Department of, of, of Animal Psychology and has all these tests. And he taught us how to do these experiments. And then you see that cholesterol does rescue much better. This is the training sessions and the spatial learning in the Morris water maze. The animals treated with cholesterol during 30 days in the, in the cisterna magna here are much better, much faster at learning where the platform is. And then obviously they spend much more time. This is distance and they do it much faster. They don't, the other, uh, they, they take a while before they find the platform, and, but, but the ones with, with brain cholesterol do better. To, we are now trying to do this uh, same experiment, still the paper, we don't know what happens now, because I'm sure they will ask for something more anyway. They always ask for something more. This is the summary. Basically, what we have, one among the million things that are happening during aging is the activation of a series of an enzyme that induces cholesterol loss. This, on the one hand, induces the loss of marks. And because of the loss of marks, we have a reduction in PIP2, more high PIP3. And this is involved in F-acting stabilization. At the same time, because of the loss of marks, we have a loss of, disso loss of dissociation between PSD95 and ACAP from the synapse. Again, more stable synapses, less lateral diffusion, less endocytosis. And because of all these things together, we have impaired LTP, impaired LTD, and decreased learning and memory. And some of these, all these things can be restored by suppressing cholesterol loss. This is more or less the story. This is the people that did the, the work in Leuven. Mauricio Martin is Argentinian. Laura Trovo is Toscana. And Silvia Menchon is also Argentinian. But there are people who are not Argentinian in this place. Because some of them are not Argentinian. No, these three are Germans, etc. And, and the, pay, the work was continued in Madrid by Anna Brachet, she's French. Again, Mauricio, who came with me, and Isabel Salas, who is Spanish. And so this is the people who, the people who trusted we're doing some good science, so trying to do science on this, uh, the Belgian contribution and the Spanish contribution, and that's it. Thank you.